Hey guys, hey, I know, two videos, one day, what? So, I figured today would be an awesome day to talk about anxiety and um, depression and uh, other things when you're facing surgery and dealing with it afterwards. Um, How can I even begin to put this? You know how things might not be going your way and you know you have some depression a few days and you feel really shitty and you think about getting on medicine and you just you just kind of feel down or you feel kind of antsy? Having weight loss surgery and allowing all of those hormones to flood your system, you get that like 50,000 times over and it doesn't quit until you stop losing weight. It doesn't quit. It's not going to quit. There's literally nothing you can do about it either. Your fat holds a lot of chemicals, um, hormones. So they are fat soluble, soluble. And what happens is, is that as you get more rotund, your body holds on to them inside your fat cells. Excuse me. And when you start shedding all of this extra skin and skin, all of this extra fat, all of the hormones start flooding your system. And that's why a lot of people right after they have um, weight loss surgery of any kind, they're like, I don't know why I'm crying so much and I don't know why I'm so upset and I don't know why I get so angry. <coughs> <coughs> I don't know why I'm being so mad at my husband or my wife or, you know, they make... We tend, I'm not going to say they, we tend to make really rash decisions, really crazy decisions, just, you know, uh, on a whim. And that's why they tell you for at least 18 months to consider not getting a divorce, <laughs> you know, or not buying a brand new car or not adopting a baby or, you know, not trying to have children or any of these major life, huge, huge decisions. They ask you to hold up, wait a minute, <laughs> let your hormones settle and decide whether or not that's what you want to do. Anxiety and depression are serious, serious things. And just because, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, I'm going to have surgery, so all this stuff's going to go away. No, because it doesn't matter what size you are. Those things reside in here. And unless you're willing to talk to somebody, unless you're willing to go to therapy, unless you're willing to go on medication if you need it, unless you're willing to put the work in, not just in here, unless you're willing to work on this, then no amount of surgery is going to help you. I am living proof of this. No amount of surgery will help me with my food addiction. It won't. What helps me with my food addiction is the fact that I see a therapist three times a week. Is the fact that I'm on Wellbutrin. Is the fact that I do my best to thwart my problems before I act on them, because I know that I'm I'm over anxious, and I know that you know I may have to stop and wait a few minutes and really think about what I'm going to say, what I think about I'm going to do. Um, there's a lot of times where I hide. Uh, a lot of times when I become overwhelmed, and I told you guys, I get overwhelmed very, very, very easily. When I become overwhelmed, excuse me, I won't leave my house. I won't leave my bedroom. I won't leave my couch. I, the, the couch, the living room right now, and my bedroom are my safe spaces. Uh, I'm a recovering agoraphobic. Um, you know, I have many, many videos on this channel where I talk about agoraphobia and I talk about my panic disorder and I talk about my neuroses but unless you have lived them unless you understand them you never quite get the grasp of what someone else is going through and everybody else is different everybody else's anxiety is different you can say oh well I have anxiety too your anxiety and my anxiety probably are not even close to the same what triggers me probably wouldn't trigger you you know, we may have some, you know, of the same kind of triggers, but it's all relative to the person. 
So I really wanted to get into this today because I see a trend with family members. I see a trend with people who are like, oh, you know, just get over it. Uh, people are worse than you are. There, there, there are other people in the world that are a hell of a lot worse off than you are. You just need to get over yourself. Uh, just go outside. You, you need to work out more. You need to, you need, you need to shut up is what you need to do. That's the number one thing. And I've started saying this. You need to shut up. Don't tell me what I need to do. You aren't in here. You have no idea what I go through. You have no idea how I feel. You can't know how I feel. And just what works for you doesn't mean that it'll work for me. And how dare you come at me and tell me that I just need to go outside more often or I need to make more friends or, you know, why won't I go here? Why won't I go do this? And why won't I go to a party, you know, that I need to get over myself? Things like that are unacceptable to talk to a depressed person or somebody who's got major anxiety issues. That's not acceptable. It is a disease. It is a mental affliction. It is a, most of the time, it's a yuki. It is not a yuki. <laughs> Obligatory yelling at yuki spot. Um, it is squirrel. And I was, I was really got the momentum there. Jeez. It is an affliction of the mind. And a lot of times people need um, medication because some chemicals in their brain may be off. It is a very hard thing to deal with. And it's very hard when you know you're going to have surgery and you're going to be in a new place. You're going to be in a controlled environment. You're going to be in pain. You know, you're going to be uh, full of all kinds of crazy medications and you, you're not, you're not going to have control of your situation. And that's what seems to be one of my biggest triggers is not being in control of my situation. A lot of the times when I'm having surgery, I have to have Ativan a lot um, for me to be able to be comfortable for me to be able to be happy, for me to be able to be, to let the, the nurses and doctors do what I need. I have to have some kind of anxiety medication and usually round the clock. So it might be Xanax or it might be, you know, it, it might, it's usually some sort of, um, you know, Clondipin, uh, Ativan when I'm having a really bad moment because there are times when I'm on Dilaudid, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. And I just start yelling. I don't, I want a cupcake. You know, <laughs> I can't, you can't have a cupcake. I want a motherfucking cupcake. And I go absolutely butt nuts crazy. Butt nuts. Crazy. On my husband, on my mother-in-law, on the nurses, on the doctor, whoever came in there and triggered whatever I didn't particularly care for, they might have just been taking my blood and I didn't particularly like it. They might have been poking on my incisions and I didn't particularly like it. And I go absolutely butt nut nuts. I don't know what a butt nut is. But, you know, I go crazy. And when that happens, they have to give me something to negate what's going on in here. So when you're giving a psychiatric evaluation, a lot of people want to tell the, uh, you know, the assistant or what, whoever you're seeing what they want to hear so they'll sign your paper. And then they get, and then you get surgery and then you're like, well, why, why, why am I still depressed? Why am I still angry? Why am I more angry? Why am I more anxious? Why am I more depressed? I, I've just lost all this weight because losing weight isn't going to fix what is up there it doesn't fix it like you have to actually work on it you have to be diligent it is just it is there are three things for success three and they're all hard as hell each one of them are super hard you have to worry about what goes in this, you have to worry about what's going on in here, and you have to work out. That's your three steps to success. Diet, exercise, mental faculties. 
You have to fix your mental faculties. You have to either go to therapy. You have to be willing to work on all three of these because if you don't do all three of these, it's not going to stay off forever. It's not going to give you what you want. And I'm doing my best not to get super emotional on here because I don't, I don't necessarily like that. Um, you have to work on your mental faculties. Like you have to work on what made you big to begin with. Why did you start putting on the pounds? Like, why did you start eating, binge eating? Why did you start overeating? Just because you're an overeater does not mean you're a binge eater. And just because you binge eat does not, you know what I'm saying? Like, there are differences to these things. A lot of people assumed, because I was getting close to 600 pounds, that I was a binge eater. I am not a binge eater. I have never been a binge eater. I have never gotten a ridiculous sum of food and just went to town. That was not my way. I didn't get, you know, 10 cheeseburgers when I went through the drive-thru. I would get a double quarter pounder meal with, with extra large fries and a gigantic ass drink. I didn't even think, like, it didn't even occur to me to order more than that because that's all I wanted. But I ate like shit and I didn't exercise, and I didn't take care of it with this, and I ate more often than I needed to. So I did overeat, because I would be full, and I would just keep shoveling whatever it is. So let's say I had that quarter pounder with cheese meal. An hour later, I would go get something else out of the refrigerator. Two or three hours later, I'd be sucking down a soda. Two or three hours later, you know, I would go in the kitchen and make myself a, a thing of ramen or, you know. So I was an overeater, but not a binge eater. They are not the same things. Um, a binge eater is somebody who, let's say, you know, they go to the grocery store and for one binge session, they get two bags of chips, uh, two cartons of ice cream, uh, two sodas, ordered the large pizza that, that they'll pick up on their way home. They'll stop off at KFC and get a, a bucket of chicken and they will sit and eat until they make themselves sick. And a lot of times they will throw them up and then go back to eating. Binge eating is not always like that, but the majority of the people that I know who are binge eaters, you know, they would just eat a ridiculous quantity of food over and over and over again and binge eating doesn't isn't just one meal sometimes sometimes that could last all day and they would get you know candy bars and they would they would get some, something would trigger or they just, oh, I gotta eat I just I just gotta eat and it's hard it's it's super hard and you know I feel sorry for everybody who has to go through this process I feel sorry for everybody who has to deal with anxiety and you know PTSD which I have uh, panic disorder I have you know I feel really bad OCD I know people who have, who have horrible OCD issues there are all things that you know lots of us are afflicted with and everybody needs to be super understanding of everybody else's journey you know just because I'm depressed today doesn't mean that you know you can come at me and be like well you were depressed yesterday too and the day before that you need to get over yourself you know, I'm tired of listening to you. I'm tired of you being down on yourself. I'm tired of hearing this. Well, then don't talk to me. Like, that's as simple as that. Like, if you can't deal with somebody having issues like this, if you can't deal with people having depression and people having, you know, not so good days, people having anxiety, then obviously you're not the type of friend somebody like me or somebody with these kind of afflictions needs and I don't want that kind of people in my life I really don't um, <coughs> I have dealt with this since I was little and it didn't stem from me being fat it is a chemical imbalance in my brain and I can't help it and do not cry. <laughs> and I have fought, um, I have fought suicidal tendencies since I was probably 11 or 12 years old. 
nobody ever wants to talk about these kinds of things. When I was growing up, you didn't talk about these kinds of things. You don't tell somebody you want to kill yourself or you have suicidal tendencies. You don't tell somebody that, you know, things are so bad today I want to cut myself. I cut myself for years. I have all kinds of scars in between my thighs and underneath my leg, places that you wouldn't exactly see because I never wore shorts. I was big. Underneath my arms, you know, I have them on my wrist. You know, I would take, well, I'm not going to get into that because that, that could be a trigger. I'm not going to do that. That's awful. It wasn't good. Let me just put it that way. It wasn't good. And I haven't done that for a very, 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 very long time. And, but I dealt with suicide last year. Even with therapy, even with, you know, losing as much weight as I did, um, I still had issues going on and I dealt with suicidal tendencies last year. Um, since then, I upped my therapy. Um, I've gone to a ridiculous amount of group meetings <laughs> and still do. Um, I have somebody specific that I, I call and talk to when I feel that way. Um, my husband, you know, I, I have a... Sorry about that. I have a, a support system in place. And for me, that's super important. Uh, you need to have a support system in place. And if you are ever feeling... That way you need to be able to talk to somebody instead of hiding it. You need to be able to feel comfortable with the people around you to tell them that's how you feel because the last thing anybody wants is to find you on the bathroom floor or in your car or you know some remote place or in your bedroom with a gun in your mouth or you know, you've taken an entire bottle of pills or you've drank and had too much to drink. Nobody wants to find you that way. Nobody wants to talk about it until something like that happens. And then they're like, well, I didn't know. She never told me. The reason she never told you is because she didn't feel comfortable coming out with how she felt, probably. And didn't know who she could trust. And, you know, all I can really say about that is that if you're feeling that way, I will link down below the suicide hotline. Um, you can always message me on uh, on Facebook under Nirvana Amber Lee under Experiencing Nirvana, and you know we can talk. I may not be super prompt, but I will definitely uh, get to that ASAP if you lead the conversation off with the words "suicide hotline." I will see that and immediately respond as soon as I see the message. Okay, So I want you guys to know that I'm always here for you and I know exactly what you're going through. Um, for the most part, probably, probably shouldn't say exactly, right? Maybe not exactly what you're going through, but I do know how hard it is living with these kinds of things. And I want you to know that you're very special and you're 100% worth it every single solitary day. And even on the days where you can't even drag yourself out of bed. And even on the days when you think that it would be better if you weren't here, that's a lie. That's a damn lie. Because things will get better. Things are going to get better. You won't always feel this way. It is never better without you. It is never going to be better for anyone if you were gone. Understand that a hundred thousand percent. It is never going to be good for anyone for you to take your life. All right, guys, I love you more than I could tell you. And I will talk to you very soon. Mm -hmm.